I invite you to open your Bibles this morning to 2 Timothy chapter 2, and we'll be looking at verses 14 through 19 as we continue this series in 2 Timothy called Gospel Words for Gospel People. And today, we're going to be looking at the subject of rightly handling the gospel. As I was meditating on this scripture, um, my thoughts uh, just went almost immediately in thinking about this, uh, even this morning, to my mother and father. My dad was a man who uh, had it as his ambition to have a family that loved the Lord Jesus Christ. Have a family that loved the Lord Jesus Christ. He, he came from a family that didn't, and so it was his ambition that he would have one. And my father was a man who was devoted to the Scriptures. He spent a lot of time studying the Bible. He taught it. And, uh, and so, as I was growing up, uh, it occurred to me that uh, if you're a really good teacher about Christianity and the Bible, you had to have two initials in your name. Because the books on my dad's shelf were by J.I. Packer and C.S. Lewis and A.W. Tozer and John R.W. Stott. Um, but more than that, um, uh, my mother was a person who really um, encouraged us in uh, a very vigorous way to memorize Scripture, not just isolated verses, but sections of Scripture. So I remember memorizing Psalm 100 as the first section of Scripture that I ever learned, and Psalm 1, uh, just as a way of kind of my mother and father really trying to inculcate the scriptures into my life. But it wasn't just about the knowledge of God's Word. Uh, my mother and father had a way of thinking about how to integrate the scriptures into everyday life so that they did something as a habit that I thought everybody who was a Christian did, but as I discovered later in life, almost no one did. And here's something that they did. They had a regular mealtime where everybody sat together. And in that regular mealtime, quite often, we would, for the entire evening, never get up from the table, but that we would talk about the issues of the day or some other issue, often with our Bibles open and thinking through how the Bible relates to everyday life. This was just something that was a matter of course in my family, and I didn't know any different, and it was only until I became older and got acquainted with other families and how they did things that I realized that this, in fact, was an unusual thing. <laughs> but one of the things that it served to do was to impress upon each of their four children the importance not just of Bible knowledge, but of integrating the Bible into how one lives. And that's what is going on here in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 14 through 19. Let's stand for the reading of God's Word this morning. 2 Timothy 2, 14 through 19. Remind them of these things and charge them before God not to quarrel about words which does no good but only ruins the hearers. Do your best to pre present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. But avoid irreverent babble for it will lead people into more and more ungodliness, and their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, who have swerved from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already happened. They are upsetting the faith of some. But God's firm foundation stands, bearing this seal. The Lord knows those who are His, and... 
let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. Please have a seat. Rightly handling the gospel. Uh, Paul says to young Timothy here to present yourself to God. He begins this section by saying, remind them of these things. Who is the them? The them is the people in Ephesus that Timothy is pastoring. You see, Paul, as he writes this letter to Timothy, ever has in mind the duties of the pastor. If Timothy is to do what verse 8 says, remember Jesus Christ risen from the dead, the offspring of David, how much more is Timothy as the pastor at Ephesus to remind the flock at Ephesus that he is shepherding of these very same things. And so he says, all the things that I've said up to this point in this letter, remind the church of these things. What are they? Well, let's go in backwards order. If you go back to verses 8 through 13, remind the church of Jesus Christ of the gospel, of the power of the word of God, of the suffering for the elect to obtain salvation, of the promises of God that's found in the hymn in verses 11 to 13. We looked at that last week. But even beyond that immediate context, go back to chapter 2, verses 1 to 7. Remind them of entrusting the gospel to others as a good soldier, as an athlete, as a farmer, Going back a bit further to chapter 1, verses 13 to 18, remind them to guard the deposit that's been entrusted to the church, taking note of both positive and negative examples. Chapter 1, verses 8 to 12, remind them to be bold for the gospel. And then verses 1 through 7 of chapter 1, remind them to fan into flame the gifts of God in the church. You see, in, remind, in saying remind them of these things, the call is to take the truths that Paul is writing personally to Timothy and then apply them to the whole church so that this letter isn't just from Paul to Timothy. It's not just from Paul to a pastor. It is, in fact, something that is for every believer, isn't it? Have you ever wondered when you read a book of the Bible, why is this one in the canon of Scripture? Why is it here? Paul wrote other letters that didn't end up in the New Testament. Why does this one end up in the canon of Scripture? And the reason is, of course, that this, the truths that are presented here are, in fact, the very words of God and that they are meant to be preserved not just for Timothy, not even just for the church at Ephesus, but for all pastors everywhere for all time, and in fact, for the church of Jesus Christ for all time. Isn't that amazing? To think about how we have been called to be reminded of the things that have happened up to this point in 2 Timothy. Now, in verse 15, he says, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved. This idea of presenting oneself to God is available. <clears throat> Did you know that availability is a key to Christian living? If you make yourself unavailable to God, you know, you've squeezed him out by all the things that are going on in your life. He just has a little tiny corner of your life that, that's going to hinder your Christian maturing, but availability, on the other hand, is a key to Christian living. This is an act of worship, Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I urge you, therefore, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship, availability. And then it says that we are to present ourselves to God as one approved. The word approved here means <coughs> tested and approved. Now, some of you are old enough to remember 
the good housekeeping seal of approval. What that meant, meant was that there was a magazine called Good Housekeeping, and they would test products, and products that they found particularly good would receive this seal of approval to say, yeah, you, could, you can, with confidence, purchase this product. Uh, a little bit later, you had some other kinds of things like consumer reports, right? You have those. Today, we look at Google reviews, right? Okay, it's got five stars. I guess it's okay to buy, right? But here, what Paul is saying is to present yourself as one who is approved, tested. A worker who has no need to be ashamed. A worker. That's an interesting description for the Christian. A worker. Not working for their salvation. Not at all. The scriptures are very clear. We do not work for our salvation. But once we are saved, we're called to be workers. Workers in God's harvest. Now, let me ask a couple of penetrating questions here. (laughs) One is, how many of us as Christians seek work? Go, there's a place where I could do more work. Chances are good. On the contrary, what we're doing is we're thinking about, how can I avoid that? I know that's a need. I sure hope somebody else steps up before I feel guilty enough to do it. (laughs) This description should kind of, I don't know, convict us. Instead of thinking about what we need to do to avoid work or to say, well, I sure hope the church takes care of that, which by the way, there's no such thing as that if you're saying the church on that because the church is you and me, right? Uh, That we would think in terms of the Christian life as one of being a worker. Now, in case you're feeling like I'm trying to put the pressure on you, no, understand I'm not. I'm not trying to guilt trip here at all. I'm merely trying to say that there's an opportunity for us right here and right now for us to serve the Lord, and there's a day coming when we will no longer be able to labor here in this world. And whatever we've done for Christ will last, and whatever we have done that's frivolous will burn. I'm reminded also of many times when I have met with very senior saints who have exhausted their bodies, you know, they can no longer do much, and they lament how I wish I would have done more. So, take it to heart and consider how the Lord is calling you as a worker. A worker who has no need to be ashamed Some of you are aware that we have a ministry for our children on Wednesday nights called AWANA, and this is where we get that that phrase. AWANA is an acronym for what's going on here in this verse, a worker and not ashamed. No faulty workmanship. And then the last description there in verse 15, rightly handling the word of truth. That word rightly, handling, literally means cutting straight, cutting straight. The same word is used in the Greek translation of the Old Testament in Proverbs 3, 6. You know, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will cut straight your path. He will rightly handle your path. Isn't that cool? Here, we're called to rightly handle the word of truth. Now, this rightly handling is not in the sense of cutting it into small pieces, but rather one who makes a straight road. It can be a term of civil engineering, right? One who knows how to mark out a straight road, a straight path, or perhaps a farming analogy of of driving a straight furrow. Accurate and plain in the teaching of God's Word, not trying to get the Scripture to say things that you want it to say. You know, so much of 
what I see in modern Bible teaching is simply topical talks where people search the Scriptures to try to find something that will kind of lend support for what they themselves want to say. And quite often, they have a whole bunch of translations and not one of them says it, but then they find one weird, obscure translation and that's the one they use in their talk. You know, that's just not rightly handling the word of truth. Uh, accurately, rightly handling the word of truth, cutting it straight, means not confusing people, not overly complicating things, not getting distracted by things other than God's Word, and not cramming the Bible into one's hobby horse. All of those are involved in rightly handling the Word of truth. But there's something more, and perhaps just as, well, I would say just as important as rightly handling the Word of truth. I've, in my life, I've seen Bible teachers that fall into two main categories. There is the Bible teacher who is integrating the Bible into their life. You can see in how they live that the Scriptures are doing some transformation of their life. It's not just an academic exercise. It's not just the science of Bible interpretation. It is, in fact, life for them to live in the Word of God, in the pursuit of God. The other kind of Bible teacher that I've observed over the years is one who does not integrate the Bible into their life, but rather can give all kinds of things and sometimes even be a more effective communicator, a better speech maker, perhaps, perhaps one who is even just as accurate in the science of Bible interpretation, but has not integrated the Bible into their life. And Timothy is being called upon by Paul to be the person who integrates the Bible rather than one who segregates it from his life. And here's the way Paul describes it. He says, avoid quarrels. That's a way that you can distinguish them. You know, the Bible has a lot to say about quarreling. Uh, I was amazed when I started my uh, investigation of this of just how much the Bible says about quarreling. Paul actually even invents a word here in this phrase, quarrel about words. I think he actually coins a word. It's the word for sword with the word for word in front of it. <laughs> the word sword, right? And... Um, the Bible has a lot to say about avoiding quarrels about words. Uh, let's take a little journey, shall we? Uh, Psalm, uh, Isaiah 58, 4, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to hit with a wicked fist. You know, the idea that they're not integrating the Scripture into their life. Romans 13, 13, let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in quarreling and jealousy. Uh, Romans 14.1, as for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. Uh, 1 Corinthians 1.11, it has been reported to be my Chloe's brothers, or Chloe's people, that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, for I fear that perhaps I may, when I come, I may find you not as I wish, but that you may, not, may find me not as you wish that perhaps there may be quarreling. Of 1 Timothy 2.8, I desire then that every place the men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. And the qualification for elder, 1 Timothy 3.3, 3, not a drunkard, not violent but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. In describing false teachers in 1 Timothy 6, Paul says, He's puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. He has an unhealthy craving for controversy and for quarrels about words which produce envy, dissension, slander, and suspicion. Uh, 2 Timothy 2, a little later, we'll get to this in our study. Uh, have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels. 
And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil. Uh, Titus 3, 2, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, and to be gentle. Titus 3, 9, avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels about the law, for they're unprofitable and worthless. And then James 4, 1 and 2, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder, you covet, cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. Quarreling is a bad thing in the Bible. Now, almost no one who quarrels thinks that they are. They think they're just defending the truth. How do we know what quarreling is? Well, look at down here at verse 16, avoid irreverent babble, for it will lead people into more and more ungodliness. Talk spreads. You see, quarreling and irreverent babble is talking about things that do not matter and debating them as though they were all important. We live in an era when debating is at an all-time low in substance and at an all-time high in name-calling and gotcha comments. Paul is all in favor of talking about things that matter, much like my family did when I was growing up around the table. But he's fearful that the church is ever tempted to descend into quarreling and irreverent babble. You see, people can think that they're doing God's work, but what they want to do is spend their time debating issues that have nothing to do with Christ or the gospel. And for those folks, if you do not join in their opinion, they regard you as the enemy of all that is good. Paul calls this gangrenous in verse 17. It's gangrenous to the church because it leads people into more and more ungodliness. Quarreling and irreverent babble includes arguments over fashion, babbling on and on about pop culture icons, debating endlessly about government conspiracies, whether it's an old one like the Kennedy assassination or a newer one like COVID. It includes wanting to be so precise in one's words in theology that the uninitiated are regarded as lesser people rather than people to be loved and mentored. It is not the mission of the church or of Christians to focus on such matters. It includes going on and on about one's favorite pastimes, hobbies, or interests, whether politics or planting a garden, sewing or sports, woodworking or weather, vacations or video games. <laughs> we should take care that our conversations be more about meaning than mindlessness, more about God, less about us, more about theological truth than human speculation. And may I add that quarreling and irreverent babble includes ascribing bad motives to our brothers and sisters when we do not know the whole story, particularly as it relates to our church leaders. When our conversation is empty or on unimportant matters or debatable speculations, such conversation takes over. It spreads. Paul says it spreads like gangrene. Notice what he has to say about it in verse 14. It does no good, but only ruins the hearers. The word ruin here is the Greek word katastrophe. We get the word what from it? Catastrophe. This is not just a minor thing. This is not just like, okay, there's all these really, really bad things over here, like sexual sin or drunkenness or whatever. There's all these bad ones, but quarreling, that's not that big a deal. Not for the Apostle Paul. This is a huge deal. This is a massive thing that tells us whether or not we are rightly handling the word of truth, and quite often, 
the people who do not integrate the Bible into their lives are the very ones who think that they are so high-minded and know the Bible so well and they have all the facts and they're really good communicators, etc., etc., but they haven't integrated into their lives and they are the ones who can even take the lead in the quarreling. Uh, Paul calls out two men in particular for the particular ways that their conversation has gone wrong. Verse 17, among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus. Now, we don't know Philetus, as this is the only place where his name appears. And wouldn't it be a horrible thing for your name to be Philetus, you know? I mean, whether you end up in heaven or hell, man, you are just really regarded forever as a pretty bad guy here, right? because of your irre irreverent babble. Hymenaeus is likely the same guy that's mentioned in 1 Timothy 1.20, uh, where he sa it says, among whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. If this is the same Hymenaeus, Timothy had apparently done nothing to deal with this guy in the intervening years between 1st and 2nd Timothy. And now the problem, if possible, is even worse. Now, it's not altogether to, uh, that we should criticize Timothy because the wrong re first response is not, uh, is not it's not necessarily wrong to be forbearing, right? To stomp on people with, without some gentle forbearance is wrong. But it is also wrong to fail to act when clear evidence of the reproduction of wrong is before you. And the wrong here in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 17 through 19, uh, well, 17 and 18, is, uh, has advanced into theological error. They are saying that the resurrection has already happened. Now, we aren't sure what that means. What does it mean for them to say that the resurrection has already happened? I'll offer you three possibilities. One, <coughs> excuse me. One is that they were teaching that our resurrection had already taken place spiritually, and that was all there was to our resurrection. It's a spiritual resurrection, not a bodily one. A second possibility is that they uh, had the thought that the body was evil, and therefore we will not have resurrection bodies. And a third possibility is that they were saying that the resurrection had already happened and all the good people had already gone to heaven and everybody else is left behind. Irrespective of what view you take on what this heresy is, notice how Paul describes it in verse 18. They are upsetting the faith of some. It's impacting the whole body. And so Paul calls Timothy to stand firm in the truth, to stand firm in the truth. The power of Christ's resurrection is muted by this bad teaching, the anticipation of reigning with Christ in company with other saints who have died before us is lost, wondering if suffering is worth it, remember this is a moment of deep suffering for the Christian church. Is, 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 is kind of doubtful now. It's unclear if there's no resurrection. And Paul wants everyone to know this. God's firm foundation stands. This evil teaching is wrong. And he tells us that God's firm foundation stands bearing this seal. Now, a seal was something that you put on a document to demonstrate that, w that it is the genuine article, came from a real place and a real thing. And the foundation, God's firm foundation for us has this seal on it. Notice that the word seal is singular. The word foundation is singular. God's firm foundation bears this seal, and then he tells us two things. Why would he do that? Why would he say God's firm foundation bears this seal, and then he tells us two things that are this seal. The reason is that you need both of these things to form the one seal of God's care, protection, approval of His own. The first one is this. It's a beautiful one. The Lord knows those who are His. 
Isn't that a comfort? He knows your name. He knows East White Oak Bible Church. The Lord knows us. He knows those who are His. This is perhaps uh, a reference to Numbers chapter 16, where Moses is battling Korah in a re- Korah is rebelling against Moses' leadership, and Moses says, "In the morning, the Lord will show who is His and who is holy." This describes God's protective care for His people. You see, God's knowledge exceeds our own. And so we should spend time on knowing God and talking about what we know about God. He knows us. We should try to know Him. That's the grand ambition for the Christian, is it not? And so this foundation is based on one pillar of the security we have in God's knowledge of us. Now, if that was the only pillar, if that was the only part of this seal we could be tempted to believe, yeah, God knows us. I trusted Christ once. I'm good. I can live any way I want to now. Look at the second part of the seal. And let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. He's not saying that as a means to be saved. He's telling us that once we are the Lord's, Now we live a life that seeks the pursuit of God, that seeks the pleasure of God. If all we had was this second part of the seal, we would say, well, I guess it's a work salvation. You just got to work. You got to get rid of iniquity in your life. But that's not what it is. It's got two parts to it. One is our salvation. The Lord knows those who are His. He has saved us by His grace. And the second is, now that we are saved... Let's run as far away as we can from sin. Amen? Let's run as far away as we can from it. This perhaps is a reference again to Numbers 16, where Moses goes to Dathan and Abiram and the elders of Israel, and he speaks to the congregation, depart from the tents of these wicked men touching nothing of theirs. You know? (laughs) Depart from iniquity. This tells us the outworking of God's sovereign care for His church. He cares for us to save us, and then He loves us enough to care for the purity of His church. The evidence of God's protective care is the holiness expressed through His people. This is why your sin matters. You see, you might say, well, my sin doesn't impact that many people. I don't know. If you're a part of this community, your sin, whether you recognize it or not, whether anyone recognizes it or not, is impacting all of God's people. And at the same token, when we express holiness, the pursuit of God, that actually impacts the entire community of God's people. God's protective care is the holiness expressed through His people. How is it that gangrene can be stopped? The reversal of gangrenous talk. Well, one of them, one way, which is a rather abrupt and difficult one, is you have to amputate, right? And that probably would be a reference to church discipline at some point, I would suppose. But I don't want to really use that analogy today as much as I would want to use the analogy of the wonderful world of antibiotics. Since World War II and the introduction of antibiotics, countless millions of people's lives have been saved from infections. It's a remarkable thing, maybe one of the greatest medical discoveries and technologies that has saved the lives of countless people. Well, how do we reverse gangrenous talk in the church? The reversal of gangrenous talk is found in the antibiotic of the pursuit of God. It is as a people, we pursue God 
that all of a sudden the things that we've been quarreling over that are uh, irreverent babble don't matter to us anymore because we have God. What a wonderful antibiotic. This morning, as you reflect on your own life, ask yourself, how am I at rightly handling the gospel? Is it just a, a book to me of learning truth that's unrelated to my life? Or is it part of my pursuit of my Creator made known through Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit? in a way that's changing me to be more like Jesus. I'm, I'm excited that God is doing such here at East White Oak in us. May he do more, amen? May he do more. Let's pray. Father, I want to pray for the person who's uh, never put their faith and hope in Christ. I want to ask you, Lord, that they would see today that um, we are not saved by our works and that only by faith in Jesus Christ can we, may, we be made right with you, God. I pray that you would help them to see that they too can have this salvation by saying to you, Lord, forgive me of my sin by what you did at the cross. I trust what Jesus did to forgive me. I believe he rose from the dead. And I want to live for him. Give me the strength and grace to do so. Lord, we pray that you would do that work of, of soul transformation in folks' lives here. Now, God, for many of us, we believe in Jesus, but we have at times gotten into quarrels about words or gotten engaged in irreverent babble, not really presenting ourselves to you as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth, integrating the scriptures into our lives and the lives of our families. Lord, I pray that you would help us to forsake this sense of distancing ourselves from the Scriptures and that we would embrace integrating it into our everyday lives. I want to pray especially for parents that they may be able to do that with their children, to engage their children from the youngest to the oldest to thoughtful reflection on the Scriptures and thinking about the, how those scriptures interact with everyday living. So that the children would grow up knowing, just as I did because of my mom and dad, knowing that the Bible relates entirely to the entirety of my life. And now, Lord, as a church, we pray that you would help us to be a church that pursues you. And that we would be made up of individuals who pursue you. For that is the antibiotic that will cure us of any disharmony or quarreling. O oh Lord, do your great work in us for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, as Paul said to remind them of these things, we have ordinances that remind us of our great salvation. And so it is utterly fitting today that we remind ourselves of what Jesus did for us at the cross by communion, this meal where we remember Jesus' body broken for us through the symbol of the bread, and we remember his blood shed for us by this symbol of the, the cup. Everybody who's a believer in Jesus is welcome at this table, whether you belong to East White Oak or not, you're just, you're welcome here. But if you are wanting to walk away from the Lord, if you're kind of 
saying, I don't really, there's areas of my life I'm going to keep from God, or if you've never put your faith in Christ, I would encourage you to just let the elements pass you by. Uh, The scriptures are clear on that, that if you're partaking of this table in an unworthy manner, you actually are bringing judgment on yourself, and we wouldn't want you to do that. If you are not a believer in Jesus, I would encourage you right now, trust Christ. Say, Lord, I believe in you as my Savior. I trust what you did at the cross to forgive me of my sin. And you know what? When the elements are passing by, take it. Because now you're a believer. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord, the Bible says, will be saved. With that in mind, let's pray. Oh God, we thank you for this ordinance of the bread and the cup by which we can remind ourselves of who Jesus is and what he has done. The bread reminds us that he who bore no sin became sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. In Jesus' name, amen.